Welcome to Brain and a Vat. We're delighted to be joined by Barry Lamb, who runs an absolutely wonderful philosophy podcast called Hi-Fi Nation. Barry is also at Vassar University, and we're going to be talking about one of the most interesting, weird, and wonderful philosophers, David Lewis. Barry, would you like to start with a thought experiment? Yeah, so let's begin with the premise of the thought experiment that we could have been tw an identical twin. It's possible. If you think about it, it just requires the splitting of a zygote at a certain point in time. I don't know if either of you are identical twins. I'm not an identical twin, but let's just say that's possible. What that means is that, uh, on David Lewis's view, is that there is a possible world. There, there could be a world. There's a world like this. The zygote split, both implanted, were born, and therefore I had an identical twin brother. The interesting question is there are many possible worlds where that happens. There could be a possible world where I'm an identical twin and I don't start a podcast, but my identical twin brother does. Or I become a professor and my identical twin brother doesn't, but my identical twin brother becomes the professor and I don't. I do something else with my life. The question, the philosophical question is, which one is me in that possible world? Because in this world, I am me. But if there were worlds in which my zygote split into two and various things happen in both in the twin brothers' lives, is there a fact of the matter as to, well, I'm actually the first one that's born or the second one that's born, or I'm the one who became the professor and not the EDM DJ or something like that? Let me flip this thought experiment around a little bit. Imagine, I want, to, I want to, you to imagine pe two people who are identical twins. I know identical twins. I see them every morning. Young people at the bus stop with my daughter. It could have very easily been the case that they weren't identical twins. That is, that their zygote didn't split. And in all of those worlds, one sibling was born and there was not another identical sibling and went on to lead a certain kind of life. Which of the twins? is that in that identity in that possible world that's the question that's the question um that's raised by this thought experiment and i'm not going to answer the question because i just raised it but, but that's the beginning of starting to think about what possible worlds are and what possibilities are that's very interesting because it sends me off in the direction of in my head of what personal identity is. So one of, one of the questions you might ask is personal identity always a one-to-one -one relation? So is it the case that because there's one of me in one possible world, that there must only be one of me in another possible world? Can't it be the case that there's one of me in one possible world, but two of me in another possible world? And why can't that be the answer? So in other words, I'm denying the question. The question you're asking is, which one is me? And I'm saying, why not both? No, that's absolutely right. David Lewis thought that thinking about philosophical questions through possible worlds is a way of coming to an answer about the question in our world. So the question about personal identity in our world could very well be the same kind of question, whereas instead of asking about the possibility of having a twin, we would say things like, what if you were transported and split up or, or so forth. But all of that happens within the same world. And you could answer the question the same way you did in our world. Maybe one can be two and two can be one here. And that leads to various paradoxes. Thinking about it in terms of other possible worlds makes you think about whether it's even possible to have a twin. That, that's a presumption that you can challenge as well. You might think that if you don't have a twin, it's necessarily true that you don't have a twin, precisely because you don't want to answer the question, one can be two in this other possible world. And similarly, you might answer the question this other way. If you are a twin, then it's necessarily true that you're a twin. You have to be a twin in all possible worlds. In any world in which there's only one zygotic survivor, then you don't have you or your twin. It's not identical to either. So these are the other possibilities. Rather than denying the question that you have to be one, you can deny that it's even possible that if you're a twin, then you're not a twin, or if you're not a twin, um, that you can be. So there's a sense in which when we talk about 
possible world, we could be using it as a heuristic device to try and solve other problems. So we can say, imagine that you made a different kind of choice and follow that counterpart version of you into this imaginary world. Uh, and that can be a useful way to solve these philosophical problems. Like you say, personal identity, what would make you persist over time? But David Lewis has this completely radical idea, which is to say, if you can imagine it, it does actually have some kind of foundation in reality. That idea is something incredible, right? That it's not just this device that we can use to solve philosophical problems, but in the imagining, it almost pops into existence. What's the sort of view on his modal realism? How seriously do other people take it? I don't think a lot of people take it all that seriously. It depends on what you mean by taking it seriously. Everything David Lewis says people take seriously in the way that they feel they must respond. It's not something that you can just let pass and laugh off. And there are philosophers where that happens. People work very hard on issues. People read and think, that oh, this is ridiculous. And they never get any traction in the community of inquirers. No papers responding to them. They don't get taught in seminars. But that's not true with David Lewis. People think it ta it's very serious. Um, they take him very seriously. Now, are there other believers in the... Uh, modal realism or the existence of other possible worlds. That I couldn't tell you with complete reliability because some people think that the physics community has come around to that, but it's arguable whether or not the conception of a world in quantum physics is the same conception of a world that David Lewis had. Um, the one thing I, I want to say before we e even get to the existence of um, possible worlds or how many other people believe in it is that. One of the things that David Lewis's view has going for it is he thinks that you can't just decide what a possible world is or what's true in a possible world. This example that I've been given, this thought experiment, is a small little example of that. If it was just a device, you can make up anything you want about a possible world, then I could just make up the answer to my question. You don't have to argue for one answer, like Jason's answer, or argue for another answer, like maybe the answer that you necessarily can't have a twin, or if you have a twin, you necessarily can't have. Insofar as you think there is a correct answer here to this question, you can't just decide and make up, well, let's just say I'm the first twin, or let's just say I'm the second twin, or let's just say I'm neither twin, and all of those are just easily made up. A lot of people are taken in by that at least. And that's a challenge because if you're David Lewis, you want to argue the fact that you can't just make up things like you could make up a story, like you can make up anything in a story. If you were to write a story said, here's a world in which I have a twin brother, I'm on the left, my twin's on the right, and we're on our way. You can make that up. Uh, but the fact that you can't seems to suggest something factual about what's true in other possible worlds. Now, that it doesn't follow. There's a lot of arguments that have to be made. But the very fact that something factual is involved here rather than something just made up suggested to David Lewis, among other reasons, that other possible worlds are real. There are facts there that we have to discover. That's very interesting because one of the reasons we might think that there is an external world outside of our own heads is because because we don't just know what's about to happen. So as you said, if this is just a novel that I'm writing in my head, well, then I can write it the way I want to write it. And I'll be able to predict everything that happens and I can a priori without experience know what's going to happen, but I can't. And the argument is, well, possible worlds are like that too. And so there's just, they're just as real as this one. They're just as external to this world as this world is external to our minds. And that's really interesting. Yeah. It is, people don't have to be thoroughly convinced by that, but it is in the direction of what if we do take seriously that there's something external, factual about a possible world, that it is a thing and there are facts happening. And then there are lots of these other things and something about the very facts in those possible worlds are making something happen in this world. And then what David Lewis would say is they're not causing things to happen in this world. But what they're doing is making true possibility, facts about what's possible here. What's possible for you depends on things that are happening in other possible worlds. So something I want to just clarify before we dig into modal realism, this idea that other possible worlds are just as real as this one, is the terms that we use 
in these discussions. So one of those terms is possibility. Uh, another one is necessity or something being necessary. And we talk about impossibility. What do those terms mean in the context of what David Lewis believes about other possible worlds? The terms have a technical definition. And that technical definition is supposed to capture the intuitive sense that we use possibility and necessity. So let me just describe the technical sense. Technical sense is just to be necessary or a necessary truth is to be something that's true in all possible worlds. To be possible is for it to be true in some possible world. Now, that's a definition of possibility and necessity in terms of possible worlds, right? Requiring you to give an account or a definition or some kind of analysis of what a possible world is. But this definition, these technical definitions or analyses, are supposed to make sense of intuitive notions of the way we use certain words, like things must be like this, as opposed to things can be like this. So possibility, let's use an example about the past. So yesterday here where I am was sunny, right? It's, it was a Friday. Could it have been cloudy? Yeah, it could have been cloudy. There was a system that was very nearby <laughs> that passed over. If it were cloudy, would you have been able to play tennis? Yeah, I, if it were cloudy and it was still warm, I would have been. You ask, you answer questions about what could or could it be. And, and on the basis of those answers, you can ask what else would be true in those possibilities. So this is the kind of talk that we ordinarily seem to understand about each other. We talk about it in terms of the past and the future. Where is John? John could be at the supermarket or John could be in the park. So that's possibility. Necessity is when we talk about what must be true. So we have very local senses in which we use that word. John's not at the supermarket or the park, then he must be home. If I've rolled those out, then this is the remaining possibilities. And so the remaining possibility must be true if I've ruled out these other ones. So what must be true, given I've ruled out possibilities, is one sense of necessity, right? This necessarily follows that he is at home if he's not at the supermarket or the park. Is there anything that must be true regardless of the possibilities? That's the sense of necessity that we're talking about in philosophy. So what is true about John, no, no matter where he is or what he's doing? So those, that's a good question. There are very trivial truths that are true about John. Whatever is true about John, he's John. So the, the law of identity is something that must be true. Some people think whatever John is or wherever John is or whatever John's doing, John must be the person who had the parents that John has. That's a necessary truth about John, people say. It can't be that it's John, but he had different parents. Because if there were different parents, it would have been a different person and not that person. So th those might be some necessary truths. So if we have a bit of a imaginary device, so if we think about our current world as being recorded in a very detailed novel. So it's the history of the world from the Big Bang till the end of the universe. And you imagine that book in a library, and we then start to imagine the other possible worlds as being these alternative versions. Alternative histories are a common genre. So you can imagine like Philip Roth's The Plot Against America, where he says, imagine that Lindbergh became president and America struck a deal with the Nazis. And so we can imagine what that world would look like. And you have all the kinds of characters from our world who are in that world, but you've changed a certain factual element and you have this other possible world. And then you have, let's say, other kinds of literature. So you've got fantastical literature. So you've got the Harry Potter series. You've got, imagine a world where people have magical powers and they go to Hogwarts and they can fly. What are the, the limits for David Lewis about these possible worlds? Is it the case that we can, we start off with something very small. So we say, imagine that Jason, you know, went to the shops instead of going out for dinner and that creates a possible world and, but everything else is basically identical. But this thing seems like it could kind of go in an infinite series. Is there a point where we can start to change the physics of those possible worlds? Is it the case that maybe you can levitate in those places? Maybe sunshine smells like blue. Does that make sense to talk about those kinds of places? 
you are asking a really deep question about the metaphysics of world that I don't even think David Lewis has a good answer for. And the question is, what are the limits of the possible or the limits of contingency? And I'll describe what I mean by that in a second. There's a very wide sense of possibility, wider than I think David Lewis would accept and even a lot of metaphysicians accept, which is that as long as it doesn't have a logical contradiction in it, it gets to be possible. So a logical contradiction is a formal contradiction that of the form P and not P. And that is so wide that even things that count as colors, something can be completely green and completely red at the same time. It's not a formal contradiction, right? There's nothing um, about the nature, there's nothing about the term red that entails that if it's something is red, it's not green, for instance. If anything, that's a metaphysical truth about the nature of color, as opposed to some logical contradiction. So if you believe in the widest sense of possibility, you think all that it takes to be a world is for there to be no logical contradiction. Then all of the fantastic stories go as long as there's no hidden contradiction in it. And then you just, if there is, you just fix it. Sometimes that happens. You're writing a novel and you didn't realize you said this thing didn't happen, and then you actually write that it did. Okay, there's a contradiction in there. And if you don't make sense of that, then you know that world can't exist. If you think, I'm writing a novel in which there are green creatures that are also red creatures, and they're tall and also short at the same time, and they're both human and, not, and uh, donkeys, right? Those aren't formal contradictions. They might be metaphysically exclusive of each other. We don't think that you can simultaneously be a human and a donkey at the same time, but uh, that's a metaphysical truth. Now, if you thought that it's more, it takes more than just, so, so there are, if you think there are fewer possible worlds than just the logically consistent ones, then you have to give an account of what metaphysical necessity is. That is, what are the, because of the nature of things, what excludes what else? And if you think that there's something like that, then you think there are fewer possible worlds. There are only the worlds where they're metaphysically coherent. That is, nothing in the world has a metaphysics that ex excludes something else. So then you can't have some a world where you have a creature that is both completely human and completely donkey at the same time. And uh, that's when you get into the nitty gritty of the metaphysics of the natures of things. <laughs> and there's just too much to, to go on here. There's just so much that is arguable, that is very specific to the metaphysics of particular things, the metaphysics of biological species, are those such that they have to exclude each other from being instantiated by any individual thing? Show me the arguments. If you have some good arguments that suggest that it is, then those worlds can exist. Laws of physics. Give me an argument as to whether or not uh, general relativity and special relativity together is consistent or inconsistent with quantum mechanics or inconsistent or consistent or inconsistent in what way? In what way are they consistent or inconsistent? In just the physical way or the metaphysical way? I don't think that there's a univocal answer to how many possible worlds they are that are independent of very specific theories about the nature of stuff that's in worlds, the nature of colors, the nature of individuals, the nature of animals, the nature of flora and fauna, and so forth even gods. Um, and then I'll say one more thing before I let you um, follow up. This is connected to this question about the nature of contingency. And what I mean by that is I haven't defined the term. Contingency is when something is true in one possible world, but not true in another possible world. So a lot of people think that one easy contingent fact is that I exist. I could very well easily have not existed. There's a lot of possible worlds where I, didn't, I don't exist. So that's a contingent fact. There is a really difficult debate that I don't know what the answer to, and I don't think the people who are much smarter philosophers than I know the answer to, is to what truths are contingent, especially metaphysical truths. And I'll give you an example. We're going to get to the nature of time, hopefully, in a little bit. And there's all this talk in the philosophy of time about whether time is like space it extends in both directions and exists in eternity. Or there's a question about whether time in the past and present exists, but the future doesn't exist yet. It's still growing. Or there's a view about whether time 
only the present exists and the past and future doesn't. Let philosophers hash out that debate. What is not known is when someone comes up with an answer, is that answer about the nature of time in our universe or all possible universes? Could time in our universe be exactly like David Lewis thinks it is, or the physicists say it is, some four-dimensional manifold? But in another universe, time isn't like that. Time happens to be described by some philosopher who's wrong about it in this world, but is right about it in that world. And what's weird about that is, is then time travel would be different in that world than in this world if time were different. And we actually don't know what the answer to that is. We could very easily think humans here are mammals. Can humans be a marsupial in some other world? And a lot of people think, yeah, there was me in another world. And I was a, well, part of a species that was a marsupial. I don't see why that can't be a human if that's the only difference and so forth. Um, I don't know how to answer that. Maybe there's a good argument as to why we can't be marsupials. But when you get to the more abstract metaphysical stuff, it's even harder for me to think, right? Could there be colors in, could it be such that colors are incompatible in our world, but there actually is a world where colors are compatible? You can simultaneously be, oh, completely orange and completely green at the same time. It's no formal contradiction in that. If there's a metaphysical incompatibility, maybe all the arguments show that it's an incompatibility in our world. That's about the limits of contingency. And I don't know what the answer to that is. And I don't think, and David Lewis never talked about it. So let's say we understand what possible worlds are. Let's just say, and we come up with an account of what's, which worlds are possible and which are not. And and which truths are contingent and which are not. So now you've got all these possible worlds which are floating around. The question is, are they floating around? Some people think of possible worlds as these bubbles, right? Yeah. So you've got this big metaverse and you've got all these universes. Now I'm using scientific language, but let's yeah. revert to David Lewis language. You've got all these possible worlds floating around as bubbles in this big kind of canvas. And is it the case that these bubbles brush up against each other? Could there be any commerce between these bubbles? This is the stuff of science fiction, is that you switch between what they would call parallel worlds, um, or switch between timelines, or switch between possible universes or splits. If commerce is possible, then this problem, which is, you've said, it, at, at least on some conceptions of possible worlds, there's different physics in each. And so if there's different physics in each, it seems very difficult to conceive of how there could be commerce between those worlds because, well, commerce is, is causal and which world's causality works in that interaction. But then there's other questions as well about if our interactions between these worlds are not causal, perhaps they're conceptual. So one way Mark initially introduced this problem is if, if there's something that you can imagine and suppose we can imagine it consistently without a blatant contradiction, then that's, that's going to be a possible world. But it can't be that possible worlds are limited by our imagination. So no, it can't be right. that just the type of worlds that are out there are delimited by our imagination. There could be things that we can't imagine, but still don't involve a contradiction and still exist as possible worlds. So the question I have is, how do we conceptualize the relationship between this world and those worlds? Is that relationship conceptual? Is it a, ma a matter of epistemic access? Is it a matter of there being a possible causal connection between those worlds? Great. I'm not a metaphysician, so I can't answer this. What I can say a little bit about what I know from David Lewis is that he took the easy way out. He stipulated that if there's any causal connection between things, they're part of the same world. So if you had a story where people are doing something along a timeline and meeting their own counterparts or counterparts of things they know, then it would be a very strange world, not an instance of people hopping between worlds. Because he just stipulated that the way that he's going to define a world is something that is closed spatio-temporally and causally. That's why the conception of many universes in quantum mechanics could very well not be the same conception of possible worlds that it's in David Lewis, because my understanding, and I have a very limited understanding of this, 
is that we're not talking about causal independence <laughs> in the worlds that branch off from the actual world because of quantum mechanics, right? It's not causally independent at all. It's not even spatio-temporally independent. When you have a branch that is related to historically to something that originated in our world. And so David Lewis would describe that as the same world, right? The same world. And you just have something very weird going on within the same world. Okay, so that's the first thing. Second thing, it's absolutely true that we shouldn't accept that the limits of what a world is is limited by our imagination. The people who are most sanguine or most optimistic about the relationship between the human mind and possible worlds say that imaginability and conceivability is some guide, but it's not a perfectly reliable guide. But they are probably also people who aren't realists about possible worlds. They don't think that they're real things. If you think that possible worlds are in some sense just stories or fictions or things like that, then of course there's going to be a connection between the conceptual and the imaginative and a possible world. To be a possible world is just to be the kind of thing that a uh, clear-headed thinker is hypothesizing and stipulating and writing about and so forth. If you're a realist about it, that better not be the case. And I don't think that is the case. But speaking as a just not a not even a metaphysician and not even a Lewis scholar, but somebody who has taken some courses and, and did a biography of David Lewis. I think that's those are the right ways to say that he thought about these questions. So you mentioned the metaphysics of time, and David Lewis wrote quite a bit about this idea around time travel. And he has this notion that you have to be logically consistent. So it is the case right now that I can sneak up behind my grandfather and I can put a bullet in his head. But if I go back into a time machine before I was born, it's not logically possible for me to shoot him because if I did, I wouldn't have been able to, I wouldn't have been born. I wouldn't be able to travel back in the past and shoot him. So Lewis thinks that you'd wind up in this impossibility situation. Therefore your gun would miss fire, you'd slip on a banana peel. There'd be yeah. these other things that will prevent you from doing it. And there's some sense in which we think on a very simple thing, right now I can choose to order a, a turkey sandwich or a pizza, but I can't decide whether I ordered a turkey sandwich or a pizza a week ago, I picked one or the other. And that is engraved into time and be a contradiction to say that I could do not that. Um, and he has this interesting notion of these time worms. So this idea of you persisting over time and maybe in the, disconnected way. So you can imagine like a map of reality that if you could go back in time, there'd be these little spots where you didn't exist on the map and other spots where you did, and you would be this kind of four dimensional creature. And that seems quite different from the, the possible world's case in the, the way often the grandfather paradox is solved is you can choose your grandfather, but it's not actually in your world. It's in some that's parallel right. world. And that's not a very satisfying way of dealing with time travel. Often when people say, I wish I could go travel back in the past. It's because they want to erase some horrible thing that happened. So they say, I want to go back in time and kill Hitler so the Holocaust never happened. And they're just going to say, that's not possible. It's not possible in this world. You could imagine a possible world in which someone did go and kill Hitler and there was no Holocaust, but it wouldn't erase our current world. We've had another guest, Sam Liebens, who has this fascinating answer to the problem of evil. So he says, imagine that God is all powerful and all good. How can we have all the suffering in the world? It's very simple. At the end of history, God goes and deletes all the bad bits. And then you <laughs> do a retake and you keep retaking uh, until there is no suffering and there is no evil. And he thinks it is only one timeline. It's just a matter of being able to edit out the bits of history uh, that are bad. That's, that's right. Yeah, the, the fundamental metaphysical commitment of David Lewis is that you can't delete <laughs> from reality. If something happens, it happens. And it's written into the book of reality. And maybe it happened earlier in time, or maybe it happens later in time. But the definition of the reality of that world is that fact is written there. So there's no deleting. There, can, there cannot be any deleting within the same world, right? The way that it's just fundamentally incompatible for what it is to be that world. So what he would describe is, look, there can be a God after an entire timeline that decides that is a better timeline that is like this timeline only with these things deleted, right? Then that God will create this other timeline with those things deleted. Now, 
Why can't it be the same timeline just deleted? Those things happen. If they happen, they don't unhappen. You cannot make it the case that something that happened did not happen. Now, but that's just the metaphysical commitment of, of David Lewis is that what exists cannot be made not to exist. And his commitment that worlds are defined by the totality of the facts, past, present, and future of a world. So given those two fundamental commitments, it just follows logically that, <laughs> that the right way to think about it is a world is defined by its complete timeline. Maybe that's in a book. Maybe you can map it out on a wall somewhere where, it's, where, where you just have the beginning of time and the end of time and there's the list of all of the events. And if there's time travel in that world, then it's going to be on that timeline. And on that world, it's going to be described exactly when the time travel took place and when this individual traveled back in time. And so since it's all already there, there's nothing special about, for instance, the present perspective of the individual doing the time traveling. When he goes back, it feels like the present to him. It is the present to him. But the timeline is the, those are the facts of the universe, right? So there's nothing about the timeline that's changing because this person went through. If anything, we can see exactly what's happening with this person in the past in that timeline. So the answer to the possibility of God deleting it's I don't know if it's a semantic issue or a fundamental metaphysical issue, but like, how do you argue about whether some things can or cannot be deleted in a timeline? The way David Lewis saw it, it just was a metaphysical inconsistency that something can be deleted if something happened. If it happened, then how could it have been made not to happen? That, that kind of thing. So something that bothers me when I read Lewis is this notion that we're all just time worms in this block universe that is the universe that has happened, will happen, and just is. Yeah, so that's right. He doesn't think of time as something which is flexible in the future in any way. Why? What happened before happened, and so it can't unhappen. Yeah. But what happened before determines what happens after that in one way. And so if you have a block, a, th a three-dimensional block, you add the fourth dimension because you're a little worm in that block, and you're moving along that block. The fourth dimension is your movement in, in, within that block. But that block is that block. Yeah. And where you move in that block, there's only one way you could ever go. Because you start at a certain point, and conditions determine that you will keep going in that direction that you were determined to go in. So once conditions are set, and they are set, then there's only one way things can go. So in other words, the universe can't branch. This universe is this universe. This possible world is this possible world. That's it. Yeah. That's it. And that's worrying. Maybe it's less worrying when you think there's a whole lot of others. And so maybe there's a bit of comfort in that. You may be not sure which one you're in. But once you know which one you're in, and if you knew all the facts about your world, then you will know all the facts about the future of your world too. Yeah, it is. And how worrying that is can be a moral concern or it could be a practical concern. I guess if you're David Lewis, how much of it is a metaphysical concern? Don't particularly like that view. I was told, by the way, just to clarify, I was told that in some ways, David Lewis's view is not as bad as determinism, but also in some ways worse than determinism, right? So they, this is the way it's not as bad. There could very well be free choice of individuals it's conceived of as little gods in, in, in our universe. Let's say, and that's consistent with what Lewis says about this. So let's say that actually what causes all of your decisions isn't something that's fundamentally physical as you go through time. When you choose chocolate over vanilla, it actually is you choosing chocolate over vanilla. So in that sense, it's not as bad as somebody who thinks that, well, humans are just some physical system like every other thing caused by physical facts to choose chocolate over vanilla. That's not true in David Lewis's view. It's compatible with his view that you, human beings could be these little gods that can that choose on their own, be the sole cause of choosing chocolate or the decisions in their lives. So that's the way it's not as bad. The way in which it's worse is 
But it's still the case that you choose vanilla and that's a truth etched in the, into eternity. So it's not, okay, that wasn't caused by the things that happened before. It's caused by you, but it's still caused by you necessarily in this world. It's not, it's not, it's, if you chose vanilla, it'd be another world. It wouldn't be this world. So in, in that sense, it's even worse. So you can be an indeterministic universe, but the universe's facts are still all etched into the timeline, right? So it's indeterministically etched into the timeline. You uh, chose all of the things that you chose in this universe of your own free will, and you can't have chose otherwise because that's the choices that you made in this timeline. So does that make sense? I think these are things to be concerned about. It's, it's actually a bigger concern than just the concern about determinism. So the other topic we briefly touched on was this notion of God, and I gather that Lewis was an atheist, but can you be open to the possibility that there is no God in our world, but that there could be a God in another possible world, and given that there are an infinite number of possible worlds, that there's at least some likelihood that there is a God out there somewhere, even if, as you say, it's not accessible to us at all because we can't travel between these possible worlds. Absolutely. Episode four is the the last episode of the series that I did on David Lewis. And it's absolutely true that he was an atheist and also a polytheist at the same time. He was an atheist about our world and a polytheist about, polytheist about all possible worlds. I think it's even better than that. Could there be a God in these other worlds? I think it's more like this. Yes, there are. There are other gods in other worlds in the same way there are talking donkeys. Now, you can be as sure that there are other gods in other possible worlds as you are that there are talking donkeys in other worlds. Absolutely. There, insofar as you have fully metaphysically coherent, consistent stories about what deities are like, they rule over some possible world. Absolutely. It could very well be that the Christian God rules in another possible world. Just not this one, because the evidence suggests that this one, such a one doesn't exist, at least according to David Lewis. But like, there is a world that's consistent with there being a Christian God, and like that world is a Christian God. Is that consistent, though? So um, the Christian God is perfect. And does perfection involve, in the case that God exists, God exists necessarily. And that means he would be in all possible worlds. That's a good question. And that's a question for Lewis and the theists to exchange theological conceptions of whether or not a God that's perfect enough to rule just one world or a family of them can still count as the Christian God, or if there has to be a single deity in all possible worlds. I suspect the answer for Lewis is that if there has to be a deity that's in all possible worlds and there is no such deity, I suspect that's the answer. What gets the count as a deity may not be, I, I don't know what conception of necessity needs to be in play for theological disputes about the nature of God are ongoing, right? So it's like, what conception of unity can be, is in play when the Trinity is also a unity in, in the case of Christianity? What is the conception of necessity that has to be in play, that God has to be the necessarily existent being? Is it necessity in the widest sense? Yeah, I don't know. I love this idea that some people talk about being born at the wrong time because their tastes just don't match the world that they live in. They say, ah, oh, I wish I was born in the Renaissance. I would have fit in so well because of my tastes about art and music. I like this idea. I happen to be a very fervent Christian and I'm right about it, but just not in this world. I wish I was born in the <laughs> parallel world where there really was a Jesus and there really was a Trinity. And there's some interesting sense of which if you've devoted your life to worshiping a God that doesn't exist in your world, but that God does exist in another world, whether that God can say, well, you know, you were close. <laughs> it's not your fault. You weren't born in my world. Maybe you should be pardoned or whether it's tough luck, son, you know, you worship Buddha in our world and actually it was Vishnu that was ruling and uh, you got it wrong. Should it be in the other world? Yeah. Yeah. In fact, a lot of people in the metaphysical literature since Lewis have thought about the existence of many times in our world and the existence of many worlds in, <laughs> as parallel. They think that's actually a good way to think about it, that a good way to think about you and other worlds is to think of you and other times. A good way to think about 
I was born in the wrong time and I was born in the wrong world should be thought of in parallel. Now, I don't know what to think about it, being, not being a metaphysician, but it's, a, it's one way people have decided that's the right way to think about worlds. Something we do a lot of on this show is thought experiments because mm -hmm. we start every episode with a thought experiment. And as you pointed out earlier, David Lewis is the philosopher for, for thought experiments. His whole career uh, was about these fantastical thought experiments. What do you think drove him in that way? Because I think, especially nowadays, thought experiments are almost a dying art amongst philosophers. A lot of philosophers regard thought experiments with skeptical distance and are worried about the uh, usefulness of thought experiments. Clearly, Lewis thought they were useful. Number one, as a biographical fact, Lewis had always been a big fan of science fiction and thought that metaphysics was a way Science fiction was a way into metaphysics. Metaphysics was a way into science fiction. They, they, they went hand in hand. So there is a philosophical picture that Lewis rejected that would make easy sense of that, which is thought experiments, philosophy, metaphysics are about human concepts and about human conceptualization and con conceivability and so forth. And if you thought those two went together, that would make a lot of sense. He would say, we do thought experiments because it's about our thought. It's all about our thought. The nature of time is not the nature of real time. It's the nature of our thought about time. And, and, and the identity is about our thinking about identity. Now, that's actually a picture Lewis rejects. Lewis does not think that philosophizing about the nature of identity or the nature of time or the nature of possible worlds was about theorizing about your head or your concepts. That, at the same time, opens up the kind of skepticism that you mentioned about thought experiments, but also opens up the very real possibility that the answers that you give to particular thought experiments that are touching reality, <laughs> touching the nature of reality. So no, this might be, a, at the end of the day, an unsatisfying answer, but the way Lewis thought about the role of the thought experiment in philosophy was the way he thought about a lot of things in philosophy. Nothing is decisive. If there were a thought experiment, it ought to be taken seriously. And particular intuitions or judgments about it ought to be taken seriously. But it doesn't mean that what they were are decisive. If you came up with one verdict, it means that this view is true. And you come out with another verdict, it means the view is false. What it all means is that you tick a box in favor of a theory if it gets the intuition right about the thought experiment, or you tick a box against the theory if it doesn't get it right in the thought experiment. Now, if you're a skeptic about the use of thought experiments, then there is a small tick against you because a thought experiment is very much human experience that people think about and have judgments about. And if you're going to dismiss them wholesale, that is a tick against you. But maybe you have a lot of other ticks in your favor. Instead of thinking that these are all decisive, the way Lewis thought about it, you just present all of the views completely next to each other. Here is a complete view about the rejection of thought experiments with some ticks in their favor and some ticks against them. Here is my modal realism and all of its glory and the thought experiments that are ticked in their favor and the thought experiments that are ticked against it. And here is a view about reality that's different and not skeptical, but still uses some thought experiments. And let's judge each of these next to each other in all holistically is the right, the right way to put it. And so I think the right way to describe his view about thought experiments is that if you had a view that rejected them, I'm not going to reject your view. I just want to see what else it comes with. because it's got some things against it. People do genuinely think about these things and come up with certain judgments about them. So one of the things that I found really enjoyable about the mini series you did on David Lewis on Hi-Fi Nation, part of it is talking to all these people that knew him, including his wife and looking at his various contributions and what he was like as a person. He seems like an incredible character, right? Just a very strange interesting, wonderful, weird guy. And one of the questions that you ask people is what his lasting impact was on philosophy. And one of these things is about a method of comparing different views, which is really a kind of bullet body exercise, right? So you look at these two different views and you go, which one is going to break my teeth less? Uh, and we're going to try and evaluate that. And it's not just a simple matter of going, well, this thing, you have to bite nine bullets and this one, it's only seven. So you pick the seven, there's going to be a kind of 
coherent thing. How destructive is that to the rest of my framework that I have? What other adjustments am I going to have to make? How strong are these intuitions on these things? But that methodology is a really useful thing in philosophy generally, right? When we're trying to believe things that are true and believe things that are coherent, being able to do that kind of reflective equilibrium between positions seems absolutely vital. It depends on who you talk to. <laughs> There's a way of thinking about the way that you've described it sounds, of course, it's vital. Of course, it's reasonable. Of course, if you were reasonable, this is what you do. There are people who I spoke to who I don't have on tape who think that is one of the most, it is the most objectionable thing that Lewis introduced into philosophy because, I'll paraphrase because I'm not even telling you who this person is, right? So um, I'll paraphrase. Philosophy is not fucking accounting. You don't like present three ledgers and do some arithmetic to figure out the truth. And, and I think here's what's behind that. There is a very much longer philosophical tradition of believing that there's something about the task of thinking about hard truths that some individuals have a particular insight about and that they're touching. And so this is the kind of thing that allows all of the greats in philosophical history to say they're overturning their predecessor, right? Their predecessors were all wrong. They didn't say, Descartes had this complete theory and here it is, and uh, here's my all empiricist alternative and let's like tick off some boxes and do some arithmetic to see which one does, has a better picture, more fruitful for science and so on and so forth. No, it was about the principle that every idea is the copy of a prior impression or something like that. And then you can, from that basis, construct an entire system that can overturn something else. There's this picture of a philosopher as having some connection with the philosophical truths that is much more intimate when you can argue decisively. Because you, by arguing decisively, you have touched on something deep in nature or something deep in reality. And the David Lewis methodological picture gets rid of that completely. You don't have a direct link at all in any way to the truths. You have some tenuous link to some things at the periphery and how do they all fit together? You don't know, but let's get the ledgers out and see which things connect with these truths and these things connect with that truth. And does this, does A go together with B? If yes, tick in their favor. Tick. Some people find that really objectionable as a methodology and other people find it just absolutely no alternative. That's how a reasonable person thinks about everything. As you heard in the series, there are people who think that. And so if you read analytic philosophy, which not a lot of people do, you will see a divide not about issues, but some people arguing one way and some people arguing another way. And there's nothing more detestable to somebody who thinks that philosophers have or need to have a deep connection to the truth than to see an opponent come by and say, hey, you're right about that. Tick in your favor. Here's a tick in my favor. This. So, you know, right now, plus two and me, minus one for you. I'm coming out ahead, but maybe next week, plus one for you, minus one for me. There's just nothing more detestable to some people than to think that is the method of philosophy. Right. I, I for one, am very glad for the David Lewis's of the world. Um, even if it was necessarily the case that there was only that David Lewis in our world, because I'm a science fiction writer and I've explored a lot of my philosophy through science fiction and gotten philosophical ideas through the science fiction as well. And I, I, I can't imagine that there is no value in exploring another possible world to enlighten us about this one, at least conceptually exploring it. It seems very helpful. I think you're right. I think you're absolutely right. What is interesting is thinking about that if Lewis's views aren't believed by other metaphysicians, they certainly explored very richly in literature. If you think about a show like Rick and Morty, it plays with this idea of saying we can't really have time travel in the way that it's often depicted in, in other kinds of cinema, but we can definitely have these parallel worlds. Although I think there the idea is that there can be commerce between them. But there's something, if you think about other ways in which time travel are, are, are done, there's those that have tried to try and make it philosophically consistent and have tried to piece together worlds that aren't just entertaining, but are, but are logical and let us 
explore these ideas through compelling fiction. And I think there's something amazing about Lewis's work in granting us that legacy. Yeah. And it's overstated. I think with some of my colleagues are calling me out on it, that people don't believe anything David Lewis wrote. That's actually not true. Not a lot of people are modal realists. Let's put that aside. But, and that played a very important role for Lewis, what modal realism was and that it tied everything together for him. But I think his views about eternalism, about time and the impossibility of changing the past and so forth, I think that's pretty standard fare now. I think a lot of people think that if time travel were to happen, that's the way that it's got to happen. And there's a lot of other things that David Lewis did, his work in language, his work in probability theory that a lot of people do accept. And in fact, accept isn't even the right word. He started a science. He started fields of research, or he was part of the founding of those fields of research. So it's my history of David Lewis is in many ways a standard accepted one where he was this otherworldly thinker with otherworldly views that not a lot of people accepted. There's an alternative view that can have. It's not the story I'm telling, which is that he was somebody who made very important advances in the study of language, mind, and probability. And he had a side project thinking about time travel and worlds and, and things like that. And that side project has a lot of people writing in response to him. But really, he was a very important thinker in these other areas. So that's how I would, just to be fair to some of my colleagues who think that's, that the alternative history is more accurate. I think the truth is somewhere in between. Well, Barry, I want to thank you for an absolutely delightful conversation. I hope that all of our listeners go and listen to High Fi Nation. The episodes on David Lewis are just astoundingly good. It's so much fun. And you have this really cool approach to philosophy, which is to take the ideas very seriously, express them in a way that's very entertaining, but in this narrative style. You're building up this beautiful picture and you're getting all these different voices in it. And it is just... Really, you're doing God's work. Even if God doesn't exist in our world, the mother possible <laughs> and, yeah. God is very happy about it. <laughs>